Hey everybody, welcome back to the Beyond the Peloton podcast. I'm Spencer Martin from the Beyond the Peloton newsletter. I'm here with Andrew Vance from the Choose the Hard Way podcast for another edition of our Tour de France crossover. Andrew, do you want to say a quick word about your podcast before we get going? I think the first thing I want to say, Spencer, is that you are not one of the best guests I've ever had on Choose the Hard Way. And Choose the Hard Way is a show where my guests share stories about how hard things build stronger, more resilient, happier human beings. And I'd love it if you'd come check us out. We're on all major listening platforms. And you can also find links to all of our episodes at choosethehardway.com. And you can hit me up on Twitter, Instagram, at Vons or at HardwayPod. All right. And there'll be a link in the show notes for anyone that's interested in checking out that back catalog. I highly recommend it. So we're talking about stage 17 just wrapped up. Crazy that we're already at stage 17 through the Pyrenees, which we can talk about the difference between the Pyrenees and the Alps a little bit in the show. Um, I thought this was like a fantastic ad for Pyrenean, Pyrenean, Pyrenean racing. Um, it was a fantastic stage, hard from the gun. Tade Pogacar wins against Jonas Vindegaard on potentially the steepest airport runway I've ever seen in my life. We got an iconic photo of them sprinting side by side coming up it. They're clearly the two best riders in this race, better, much better than Garrett Thomas, who's much better than everyone else behind him. Andrew, did Tade, it, was this a good stage for Tade Pogacar? He won the stage, he celebrated, he looked happy. At the same time, it kind of looks like Vinicard has us wrapped up. Predictably, Spencer, Twitter is mad at Tade. Tade should not have thrown his hands up and been happy that he won an incredibly difficult stage of the Tour de France. Shame on him. I agree. No, I want no happiness. I was, I'm glad I was not watching this one in Lance Armstrong's basement. I think he would have had some choice words for Tade's celebration there. It, it does. It, it is kind of like bending our reality a little bit where, yeah, he wins a really hard stage um, and, and pretty impressive fashion i mean they crushed everybody i couldn't believe the time gaps here just for an example garrett thomas finishes fourth on the stage and he's two minutes behind over two minutes behind him you just look at quintana finished 10th at three and a half minutes back i mean these are big gaps this is a hard stage impressive win he's technically not lost the race he gained four seconds on vindegaard certainly not what he needs to win but yeah, it's a funny, it's a, it is a funny thing to quibble at. I did have a thought when he crossed the line. I was like, is he a little too excited? Like, what's going on here? But having had 30 minutes to kind of decompress, you, you got to celebrate the wins, right? Yeah, I went outside. I took a walk. And I'll tell you, one of the things that I heard when I was outside, I live here in rural Maine. It's beautiful. It's generally really quiet. And Spencer, I have a neighbor who has a passion for his backpack leaf blower that is unrivaled. I used to run, <laughs> I used to run a lawn care service. Pardon me. We're going to come back to the tour in a second. But this gentleman, he, he goes hard. He likes his property to be clean. He strikes me as a uh, maybe like get off my property type. Um, but I recently saw him getting out a ladder and climbing the ladder to backpack leaf blow his roof. And to me, that bespeaks a level of commitment, attention to detail, attention to excellence, and optimism. And when I think about <laughs> optimism, I think about Tade Pagachar. And what I saw in the race today, again, lots of action on Twitter and in different text threads. A lot of people saying, you know, Tade really, he blew it in, in the first 10 days of this race. He was going too hard. That's why he can't get that gap on Vinegard right now. He, I mean, you and I were going back and forth. You're like, why isn't he attacking? You should have gone sooner. Nonetheless, you know, they say that youth is wasted on the young. I don't think that youth is wasted on Tade Pagachar. I think that he genuinely believed he could go that hard at the beginning of the race. He could keep going, that he could win. And I think he still believes that he can win the Tour de France. And while people might criticize him for throwing his hands up today, he won an incredibly difficult stage of the Tour de France. So I say chapeau, hats off to Tade. I think he earned the right to throw his hands up. And we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of days here. In his post-race interview, he's just an ice man. He's like still optimistic, just watching his body language, his eyes when they asked him, Tade, do you believe that you can still win the Tour de France? Yeah, of course I can. Like I'm going to win the Tour de France. He still believes that he can do this. And given the grand reversals we've seen so frequently in the final two days of grand tours in the last several years 
I think he might pull a rabbit out of the hat. Um, I mean, as far as like financial advice, Vinegrad's got this one. Like, this is not going to be one by Pogacar. As far as like fun and like magical thinking, yeah, he could do it. And, you know, this could be like the first brick in a foundation where Jonas is weakened and then he cracks tomorrow or or at least Tade gets like a minute and a half tomorrow and then wins it in the time trial. I, I was one of those people like during the stage, I was texting people like, what the heck is he doing? They're riding what to take Jonas to the line. This doesn't make any sense. But looking back, they were at terminal velocity. Like they're setting records up these climbs. There was no attacking to be done. He could not go faster. Um, if Jonas was going to be dropped, he would have been dropped. We saw Garen Thomas, who's very strong, you know, who I've been impressed with, with how strong he is at the tour. He just got popped. Like that would have happened to Jonas if Jonas was weak. There was no testing to be done. Tade's team with started with four. I think it's what with four riders because Rafa Micah dropped out after his chain broke yesterday. We'll drop. We'll talk about that a little bit. That's crazy. Um, and they just, as the Euros would say, they bossed the stage. Like they took it by the scruff of the neck and crushed everybody. Like rode everyone into the dust, ground them into nothing. If Jonas was going to be dropped, he would have been dropped. And then should we talk about the, did you see, catch this double clutch at the, in the final pitch? And it, it is a funny climb where it's, it's steep. Like for us, for all of us listening, we would do the, the paragoud and be like, oh my, that was really hard. But it's not a particularly brutal climb before they get to a runway. It's like a 20% runway for planes. I guess there's a ski resort up there and the idea is you can fly in and you land uphill so you don't fly off the side of the mountain and then you probably take off. I don't actually know. Maybe you, you take off downhill. Do you take off going uphill? I don't really know. I'd love to find out. Please fly me there. Um, but they're going up this runway and, you know, Roman Bardet attacked Chris Froome there in 2017 and took like 20 seconds in the last 300 meters. So it is an unusual climb where it's not super, super hard before they get to the runway. If you're going to take time on someone, you can take them. You can take it on the runway, and it's so steep that the time compounds. It looked like Tade tried that. He went early, like 300 meters, 250 meters, which on 20% is a really long ways. He saw he wasn't going to get a gap on Jonas, and he, he like slowed down. It, I thought he was cracking, and he almost, they almost track, did a track stand on this steep finish. And then as soon as Jonas went, Tade kind of started his campaign to win the stage. I think before that, that was like a move to try to drop Jonas. And he, so he split his little sprint up into two almost campaigns, one to take time. Oop, I'm not going to take time. I'll just try to win the stage and that's going to be fun. And I'll get a time bonus. So I was impressed by, by that maneuver at the end. The, the runway, Spencer, particularly that front on view with the heat shimmering off of the runway as they were charging towards the finish line, like quite a visual and just a real France TV moment. I, this is a much broader debate that I would love to have with you right now. When we get to these finish sprints and they cut to that front on shot and you have no sense, you just like there's no way to have depth perception. You can't tell what's actually happening in the sprint. And then typically they do cut back to the overhead shot or a side on shot when they're maybe within five to 10 meters of the finish line. Am I alone in thinking I would like to actually watch this unfold from an overhead or side view so that I can actually tell what's going on in the sprint versus going to the wide shot from the front where you get the scenery and have no idea who's leading the sprint? It's funny you bring this up. I mean, this would be most people probably prefer the dramatic front shot, but in soccer, like I can select normal camera where it's more dramatic, but I can't see the whole field or tactical camera. And it's like an above the stadium view and it's less dramatic, but you can see everyone moving around. That would seem to be the solution, right? Like the images are being captured. Just let me select my view for the final kilometer right like if i want to watch it from above i can watch it from above if i want to watch it from the front i'll watch it from the front or i'll select the mixed option which is they pick for me does that seem like overly comp i feel like that should have happened already yet it hasn't it's very weird that yeah you bring up a good point because especially in sprints like this and bunch sprints even more i mean you can really tell what's going on from that overhead shot you have no idea what's going on in the front shot. The cameras are, are high quality and the depth, the depth of field is so deep that you really don't know who's ahead of whom. 
they probably like that. It like keeps it dramatic. You don't know who's going to win until they cross the line. Um, do, so you came away from this thinking Tade could win the stage. He's got this. The stage or the, yeah, I, Sorry, I, I the, thought it came away from the I stage had, thinking he could win the tour. Yeah, absolutely. I had a strong feeling he could win this stage after he did. And I definitely have the feeling that he could still potentially win the tour. And, you know, Thomas, the tank engine was just chugging along back there. I know he lost substantial time today. It probably, he's definitely riding for a podium spot right now, but I, I kind of keep thinking about how, you know, Prinian pavement punishes. Like we saw this with Matteo Jorgensen yesterday. I thought that we might have a moment like that today and I'm not recalling which rider it was, but there were a couple instances of having some slippage uh, during the descents today. And there were a number of times when different riders were going hard. They were attacking into the descent to try to take back some time. And, I, I, you know, a moment like that could completely shuffle things. It's not going to probably give Pogacar the margin that he needs to win. And in the time trial, gosh, it's hard to imagine this time differential being closed. Yet you never know. Like, we've seen so many riders implode on the penultimate day or in the final day of the race that I still believe. Um, so I don't know if you, I mean, Brandon McNulty hats off to him. I mean, that was an unbelievable ride. What he rode yeah. like the final two climbs at a pretty high pace. I did just see a quote from Jonas saying, I'm shocked at the pace. I'm shocked at how easy the tempo on the final climb was. There was no chance to beat Pogaccio in the sprint with such fresh legs. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's probably just a little bit of gamesmanship because Brandon was, you know, was really trucking on that. If you just look at the gap between Thomas and the front two, they increased it by over 30 seconds on that final climb alone. And Thomas, I don't think Thomas blew up. You know, he was riding a hard pace that entire climb. So they were moving on that climb. Brandon McDonald did great. Off the descent of the Col de Zet, he was, it was sketchy. I really thought he was going to bring down Pogachar. He was, almost hitting the walls out of every corner. Vindegaard was clearly agitated, was like coming inside on each corner in case that Brandon took him and Pogacar at himself and Pogacar out, that he would have a bailout option. So he, I did think for a second, are we going to see the front three guys just get taken down by McNulty here, who rode off a road at last year's tour, if you remember that. So some bad memories, some bad mojo on descents for him. And then, I mean, it would really have to be you know, if Pag if Vindigard crashes, Pagachar that could give Pagachar the edge. If Pagachar crashes, Vindigard has this. Vindigard would almost have to break a collarbone for Garrett Thomas to pass him because he has five minutes on him in the GC. Even a a bad a two bad days might not net that. The only thing about the final time trials we're not getting. I'm looking this up just so I'm giving people right info. I don't think we're getting quite the time trial we got in 2020 where the steep finish kind of opened it up a little bit more unless you completely fall apart on a flat time trial. It's not completely flat. There are some bumps, but it's hard to just completely melt down unless you are, you're dehydrated or you have some type of physical quirk or problem. Spencer, would you have a problem with time trial, like aero time trial bikes being banned and us going back to a Merck style format? For individual time trials yeah i've been thinking about this someone was asking us about this on twitter yesterday yeah. um that's a good question we kind of it feels like the slower speeds would the slower speeds would probably help the stronger riders more like Filippo ghana would probably have more of an advantage because now you can get a really slippery setup um i'm just thinking of you know someone like roman bardet or someone like even Naira Quintana, who's not putting out a ton of watts, can just be so aero that he can mitigate the damage to a rider like Van Aert or Ghana. But if you're on a road bike, the gaps are going to be bigger. Um, for the GC, that could be kind of interesting. And it would, you know, it would probably kill and it would like kill innovation in time trial bikes. I don't know. I guess I'd be for it. It would simplify things. It feels like that's a lot for teams to have to deal with, like carrying around time trial setups. But I guess that is also part of the sport, like spending time in your time trial bike and, you know, you're sacrificing time, not on the time trial bike by doing that. So 
you'd lose that component. I don't know. I'd be I'd be fine with either one. If they got rid of it, I think that's interesting. If they kept it, I think it's interesting. The thing I've been thinking about even more than that is how do you feel about team time trials? Would they had one when Bernal won, which is one of the reasons he won in 2019. We haven't seen it since. It seems like that's a way to keep big budget teams like Yumbo and Ineos from just like Yumbo literally bought the podium at the Olympic time trial championships last year and would be able to destroy everyone if there was a team time trial and Jonas would have like a five minute lead right now. I assume that's why they got rid of it. Do you miss them at all? You know, as a young boy in Kansas City, Missouri, I the equipment used to fascinate me. I used to find time trial equipment to be really fascinating. I thought it was cool. The technical aspect of it appealed to me and the idea that you could get this specialized equipment, not specialized the bike company, yeah. but spe- <laughs> right? Yeah. Although you you know, apparently you could get really fast equipment from specialized the bike company as well, and I'll loop back to that in a second. And I thought that that was interesting, compelling. I would geek out on reading, you know, in Winning Magazine or Velo News, looking at all the new technology that was being debuted. And in those days, it certainly wasn't the full head next sleeve. Um, And the longer I've watched the sport, the less I find it to be interesting. And the more I believe that it makes cycling not relatable to the average person or the casual cycling fan. In fact, we had some friends over while we were watching the tour the other day, and it just reminded me how incredibly complex what's happening within the races, just trying to explain to people the whole concept, even of the yellow jersey, lowest cumulative time, makes sense to us, of course, and probably to everyone listening uh, to this podcast. But if you're thinking about the sport trying to expand its mass appeal, which I'm really curious to see what happens once this Netflix series drops, if we see a big bump in interest in world tour cycling, or if it's just too esoteric, not relatable, if the characters aren't strong enough, I have a feeling that they're going to take care of that in the editing. And yeah, so these days I would like to see time trialing on time trial bikes go away. I don't want to see team time trials. The aspect of team time trials that I found to be most interesting historically was just seeing teams totally implode. Like they would just, it seems like a lot of, you're right. Some teams are the very best at it. They use it as a huge opportunity, but most teams, it seems like didn't have the time to focus on it as a team. They didn't put it in the work or preparation. And like, there's a whole aspect of bike preparation uh, for the mechanics. It's a huge burden. The equipment is finicky. And then you would just see you know, teams inadvertently dropping one or two riders, you know, and so that there was an aspect of drama and that you could always kind of see the heightened drama within a team. Or if you had a truly weak team, you could see it come apart before your eyes. That was moderately interesting, but I don't want to see them in the race. I want to see the strength of the individual riders and the teams in the context of more conventional racing scenarios decide the outcome. And when it comes to individual time trials, I mentioned specialized bicycles. I don't recall off the top of my head how many teams are riding the Tarmac SL7. And this race, but there are a handful of teams. I know we also have a handful of teams racing on the Canyon equipment. But just kind of this idea of stock equipment is really interesting to me. And I think if you have people riding the individual time trial, Merck style. I think it's just more relatable to the average person. It's something they're going out and doing. It's a position that they ride in on their daily rides. And there's more of that aspect of the little 500 to this. And, you know, I think the little 500 is a really interesting bike race that takes place at uh, University of Indiana. And it everyone rides the same bike. It's on a cinder track. And you know, it's just really easy to understand what's happening. So that's what I what I would like about eliminating completely the team time trial, shift the individual time trial to a drop bar conventional bike. And something that's that's emerged in the modern era of time trialing is the bike swap. I know we've talked about this on previous episodes. I'm not a fan of someone stopping in the middle of a time trial 
a bike coming off the roof, someone oh, getting on it. a different bike. I know you. I know oh, you. I, I, dis- I disagree it. with you. I think it's say, like, more, say more about that, Spencer. What do you I love th- about people stopping and having a car hand them a different bike than somebody running and pushing them? What does that have to do with bike racing? Tell me. Because it, it adds uh, it adds an element that they are in no way talented at, and I think it's in some situations it does help. In most situations, I think it's costing people time, and it's hilarious to watch the best teams and riders just continually make mistakes because they're watching other people doing something and thinking they should do it. Um, it's a great example of this. I think it was the 2020 Slovenian time trial national championships. Primoz Roglic takes a, I think this is right. Takes a t- take like switches bikes halfway through. Pogacar doesn't and wins. I'll have to go back and rewatch that to make sure I'm getting that right. But, you know, I think it's like, I think it's not in in the most extreme situation. It probably helps like the 2020 tour de France in most situations. It's a huge mistake and it's funny to watch teams make it. I would also be fine if they were just, yeah, you got to ride the same bike, the same style of bike that you start with and you finish with. That'd be fine if they got rid of it, but you do bring up a good point. When I was first into cycling, I loved the mechanical aspect. I was always reading about the bikes. Couldn't get enough of it. I really do not care at this point. And it, but it's interesting how, you know, like the stop, like stock car racing, like NASCAR racing, the origin of that is that stock cars, like you're racing cars that are stock, you can just go by. And cycling's almost getting back to that even more. Um, I was talking to someone who did the mend finish at the 1995 Tour de France, and they did it faster than Michael Matthews on a lighter bike probably than Matthews was racing on in 1995, you know, so these bikes are just almost getting, they're, they're better, like quote unquote better. They probably ride fantastic, um, would be great to own. They're getting heavier. Like they're getting probably quite a bit slower on climbs. I almost like that, you know, like UAE's Colinagos are kind of ducks. Like those are not fantastic. Those are not cutting edge bikes. I think Cervelo's or Yumbo Cervelo's are, are pretty advanced. But yeah, you know, it's fun. It's kind of fun that there's just like the KTMs that B and B hotels are on. Like those are not; those would be fantastic bikes for probably any listener of this podcast to own, and they would enjoy riding them. These are not F one cars. Like those are not cutting edge pieces of technology. And I do kind of like that the bikes almost are getting worse for because of like market reasons because it costs so much to sponsor a team. There's four like teams are all getting the same four molds of the carbon bikes and then the bike industry is kind of all just making the same bikes because of that and it makes it more about the riders like individual riders you know as opposed to like the team time trials and stuff like that and there are certain aspects of the equipment that just continue to boggle my mind we saw that uh micah break his chain yesterday who's right? maybe is the that- most important rider for Bogachar, yeah, and he's standing. He's out of the saddle, which you know a lot of people do. I imagine these chains are new. Like I think they're cha- changing the chains probably every three or four stages, and his chain just snaps. I mean, it's it's almost incomprehensible. I mean, how many times have your has your chain broke when you're standing up? I, I don't think it's ever happened to me. And in the worst possible moment in the race, and as a writer, if you've ever been i'm probably everybody again everybody listening has been in this situation where you're going all out you're standing climbing part of what you're doing is you're rotating your hips to generate more force you're driving your knee towards the bars and if if you break or drop a chain at that moment it's not good he i mean that save yesterday also was you know that was world class as well because typically if you break or drop a chain in that moment you're going to have a low speed high impact painful fall he gracefully settled his crotch area on the top tube without a high degree of impact from what i could tell and then got off and dealt with it but he really could have been pretty severely injured in a low speed situation like that i know it sounds improbable if you haven't experienced but you can really hurt yourself in a low speed fall like that where you're putting out a very high degree of torque and then suddenly you have no resistance yeah, he could have been really hurt, and Vinegar and Pagacar could have been really hurt, and he was hurt enough that he couldn't start today. 
it, and it probably looked innocuous to people on TV, but that is, you're saying it's a lot of torque. And once you stop moving, you can get really injured. I mean, what I, they're on campy, so they're not on, they're not part of this Shimano disaster that's striking the rest of the Peloton. I, I wonder, I mean, it's my pet theory is that did we go too far with 12 speeds? Like, because you can't, the bikes are not changing sizes. It's the same space for a cassette to get more speeds. You have to shrink the spacing. And that means that sh- the chain shrinks, which means it's less stable. It's less strong. I mean, how many t- nine speed chains are like, they look like track chains now. They're, they're so beefy and the shifting was really reliable. People didn't drop chains that much with nine speed and even 10 speed. It seems like with 12 speed, I mean, we have chains breaking, brand new chains breaking, people dropping gears all the time. I wonder if it's just a bridge too far, but that's my own pet theory. Yeah. So Spencer, I had this in my notes as well. I know that this is going to be controversial, but I think that we should actually go back to 11 speed group sets. They perform better. These companies have had a chance to perfect the technology. They're using it in the highest level of racing. It appears to not be working. I don't really know if it's providing an advantage to the riders. It's maybe just a way to get people to buy more stuff. So we should go back to 11 speed. What do you think? Yeah, I agree. I, who's watching this thinking, wow, I want that 12 speed. That looks awesome. I would love to always have a drop chain and to be breaking my chains while I'm out of the saddle. Like, no, thank you. Um, next controversial topic. Let's talk doping. Um, UAE, the UAE like trio or duo of McNulty and let me make sure I have this right. It was McNulty. Pagachar and Vindigard go over the Coldet, the Coldez, the Col, sorry, the Colzet. Uh, faster, they get the record. It's faster than Pantani, Ulrich, and I believe Richard Verink in 1997. They did this on stage nine. It was the they that was the last climb in a much harder stage, and then they descended down to the finish line. People were kind of freaking out about this, saying that oh, it's like a clear sign that UAE is doping, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not so sure. I mean, that was a much harder stage in 97. And those were like, Pantani was an amazing rider. Ulrich, amazing, talented rider. Those guys were not always incredibly fit. And like you see Pantani and you freak out. But 97, I don't even think he was really contending at that tour. I mean, that stage, after that stage, he is, he's 15th overall, four and a half minutes back. Like, I think people just see these names and they think, wow, if you're going faster than them, you must be doping. But a lot of times those guys were not incredibly fit and they didn't race the stages as hard as they do now. I mean, this was an all out stage from like gun to line and that type of racing just did not happen very often back in the day. Uh, they were they were not as as fast as you remember. I mean, maybe on one or two climbs per year, they were unbelievable, but it's just a different level of racing now. What do you think? Yeah, pull up a chair, listeners. Let us tell you about a bygone era when a writer like Jan Ulrich, who was one of the very best in the world, would show up at the Tour de France a few kilos heavy, and he would ride himself into shape during the race, and then he would be strongest as they got into the third week of the race. I think you might be right there, Spencer. We also have to remember that Pantani loved to climb in the drop bars. I mean... Yeah, you just have to think about like what that brought to his riding style. I'm making a joke. You're not laughing. That's okay. But Pantani did have that unique climbing style. And I think that uh, you're right. Like today was a much shorter stage and they went from the gun. They went as hard as they could. And I don't think that that necessarily was happening in 97. So I think the difference with those climbs with Ulrich and Pantani, Pantani, as we know, he always climbed in the drop bars and you i think it's debatable whether that gave him an advantage or disadvantage ulrich would always come into the tour a few kilos heavy ride himself into shape would suffer a lot but he often would be stronger in the the final parts of the race and i think you're right like we saw today this was a much shorter than normal stage which is one of the things grand tour organizers have been doing to inject drama into the race and to disrupt the formulaic manner in which these events sometimes unfold in the latter uh, portions. So yeah, I think this was a bit different. I mean, it's definitely, it's, you don't want to like too much of a good thing. You know, if every stage was a hundred kilometers, it would probably get stale. Um, but these periodical, periodically like shortened stages 
are very exciting because it allows the pace to be on the whole time versus um, even that stage the last time that they did this or the last time it was like a big GC set piece, you know, it was almost 200 kilometers. If it's that long, it just gets a lot slower at the beginning and it's like it's a inverse effect. You would think that the gaps would be bigger on longer stages, but it's actually smaller because it's too hard for everyone to race all out the whole time. If it's shorter, it's all out from the gun and you get massive gaps like you got today. Um, and it's just a different style of racing. I mean, I'm not saying, I think it would be foolish to think that this whole Peloton is clean, but it's also, I mean, we don't really know, like, unless we're there, unless we're watching the transfusions, we probably don't really have any idea about what's really going on. And, and oddly, their bikes are probably heavier than the guys back then, which adds an interesting wrinkle to it as well. But as you say, I mean, you can never, if someone came into the tour overweight right now, th there's no way that they would get time cut, like on stage five. Like you just can't be as out of shape as you could be back then and get away with it. Yeah. And Spencer, I don't have a high degree of interest in who, who is the top American rider in the race or who is the top North American. I'm pretty much interested in who's winning the stages and who's leading the race overall. We could talk about whether we have interest in the polka dot jersey or not. And wow, there are a lot of North Americans who are really performing in this race. I'm really impressed. And I think we have this this new generation of riders coming up from uh, America in particular that are just playing a criti critical role in this race. What thoughts do you That's have about fine. that? So stage 16, yesterday's stage, you had a North American winner, Hugo Hool, North American third place in Mike Woods, North American well, basically, Matteo Jorgensen was closing down on them. In theory, you could have had a North American podium there. On one hand, that's amazing because we've stunk for so long. On the other hand, it's like there's like half a billion people in North America, right? So it would make sense that some good cyclists would be coming out of it. It is exciting, though. I mean, Brandon McNulty's a legitimate world-class talent. Matteo Jorgensen, how did he end up on Movistar? I still don't quite understand that. That's like the most insular Spanish team and this guy from Boise, Idaho, ends up on the team. I, I don't understand. I would love to talk to him about how that happened. Um, and Quinn Simmons is also just like a world-class talent who are, I mean, Nielsen Palace also amazing. Sepp Kuss also amazing. I don't want to leave anybody out. But McNulty and Jorgensen just have been at the front in these hard, hard third-week stages. Been really impressive. I think it's exciting to me. You know, I don't want to be like Amer Mr. Captain America who just taught like Vela News is really bad about that. It's like Pukachar wins the stage and then but let's not talk about that. Let's talk about McNulty instead. But it's cool that, you know, I think you were mentioning this a few episodes where you have juniors be really good from the US and then they just stink once they get to the pros. They just there was some disconnect. It was not transferring so it's cool to actually see these really talented juniors blossom into world-class professionals because there's no reason they shouldn't be and let's not forget Seth yeah. Kuss, right? who was amazing yesterday yeah. too yeah amazing and there so there seems to be kind of this this sweet spot for the types of writers that we're producing and the roles that they're playing within these teams and you know whether they could actually be grand tour contenders i don't know if that even matters just the fact that they're animating the race and playing very significant roles within these teams is impressive and a bit unexpected not sep Kuz so much but as you noted seeing some really outstanding rides from all of these riders i also yesterday the victory like a very touching one and i was really disappointed to see Jorgensen go down because I, I think he had a really good shot at actually winning the stage and it would have been an even more dramatic finish. What do you think? Yeah, I go back. I, I thought when they went over the climb, they were 24 seconds behind him. I thought Jorgensen was going to pin him back and win that stage. You know, on re like on rewatch with having time to think about it, Hugo was cooking. I mean, it would have been hard to pin him back. And then there's no guarantee so Mateo would have had to pull Mike Woods up to Hugo and then win the sprint with the guy who's just been sitting on his wheel. It would have been difficult. At the time, in the, in the heat of the moment, I did think he had it. Obviously, I, he deserved, he's been fighting, fighting, fighting for these stage wins. I would have loved to have seen him get it, but it was also cool that a 31-year-old 
Quebecois rider who's never won a professional race. I don't count national championships as professional races because they're not technically professional bike races. They're I think they're amateur events. So that was cool that he get he gets his first win ever. And he's only, I mean, it's like it's I'm not saying this in a mean way, but the only reason he ended up on Israel Premier Tech is he was like a late off-season addition because Premier Tech switched sponsorship from Astana to Israel Startup Nation, which is what it was called at the time. And he was one of the riders they brought along. And it was like, you know, you guys have to take full sang and Hugo and then maybe one other rider if, is contingent upon our sponsorship. So, and same thing with Simon Clark. He was a late, late, I think he got picked up early this season. He was unemployed sitting at home. So the two riders, they weren't really targeting and they just kind of picked up because they were available, won them two tour stages. So that was a, that kind of made up for the sadness of Mateo crashing on that chase. Yeah, I thought that if anybody was going to crash on that descent, that's it was kind of be the Mike funny Woods. irony of that. That <laughs> Woods doesn't go down, has a pretty good descent. Actually, he is getting better. Um, I think he has the stigma as being the worst descender in the peloton. I think McNulty and uh, Pino are. I mean, Pino is coming after him hard for that title. There was a couple points today where he had to unclip. And that actually brings, let's have this be our last thing we talk about. I have like a Henry Hill morning at the last hour of Goodfellas. I have like a crazy schedule I've got to keep up with here. I've got helicopters flying over my house. Maybe the feds are closing in later, maybe not. We'll see. But the Pyrenees are much more, they're a much different mountain range. They're an older mountain range. They're not quite as dramatic. They don't have like the dramatic peaks that you'd have in the Alps. But the roads just seem to be like tar kind of placed along the mountains just uh, like over paths that were maybe used to get Hannibal over from Africa and so he could invade Rome um it makes it much more rugged racing it has like a almost like a weird dream vibe it's just you're kind of out in these eerie mountains there's not a lot of people and those roads are tough I mean you saw Pino almost go down a few times you saw McNulty almost go down a few times I much prefer uh, the racing in the Pyrenees to the Alps. How, how about yourself? Yeah, the Pino of it all, seeing him tripod was frightening. And, you know, as you know, Pino almost left the sport because of his fear of descending. That's, that's how bad descending at high speed in these mountains freaks him out. And, you know, if you were to jump into this scenario, it's hard to forget watching these guys on television, but they're sight reading this train. They're moving at incredibly high speed. It's speeds that for most people, like w- if I hit 50 miles per hour on my bike on a downhill, you know, I tend to ride pretty cautiously at this point in my riding career, but that freaks me out. Like crosswinds are hitting you. Um, and Pino was having a hard time controlling the bike. Once the foot came out, you just knew his confidence had to be just shattered. And never that a was probably a it. Descent when the foot comes out. Yeah. So that was it for the day for him from a, I think from a mental point of view, maybe the body was willing, but the spirit was not there. So you get more dramatic results and looking at the roads, they actually look like they're surfaced much better. Many of these roads look like they have been recently resurfaced. It's not like in the early two thousands where you would have a worn down pockmarked road with strips of tar where they'd been patched up, but nonetheless, the surface itself seems to be melting and you see riders tires slipping around or they're breaking and suddenly their their tires lock up so just much more unpredictable surface for descending and it does deliver more dramatic results i we also have to think about is that the thing that we want deciding races well what yeah, do you think Spencer? Yes, yes we do want that i mean the there actually yes, is there must be some interesting political story behind this i'm just looking at pictures of all the climbs today the the roads are much better than they used to be we don't want that deciding races let me clear that up like the melting of the tarmac like i yeah. still want to go back to 2003 and not have balaki crash so i can see if he would beat lance armstrong well, that's that's like no good uh but i love the pyrenees because the because the climbs are just kind of like slapped on the side of the mountain, they're really irregular and there's no big valleys. That's the big thing I noticed. Like in the Alps, you can have a, you can attack over a climb and then you have this like 15 kilometer valley you have to trudge through in the Pyrenees. I don't know if you noticed today, they're either going uphill, downhill or starting the new uphill. There's almost no valleys to speak of just because everything's kind of crammed right together. 
you know, that's my favorite thing about this, this t- style of racing we get in the Pyrenees. I think one of my favorite things in the last two days is that Quinn Simmons clearly listened to our podcast and decided, you know what, you guys are right. It's time to shave my beard. So we've, we have a clean shaven Quinn Simmons, I think for the first time in his racing career, Geshka, it looks to my eye, like he's, he's still sporting the beard, perhaps very important from a personal branding and recognition point of view. He does. He's, he, yeah, he's he's fully committed. It did look like he went in for a trim. And Spencer, I know we're tight on time here. You've got to get over to the Denver Palantir office, <laughs> I think. Um, but what uh, what happened with Geshka? We had one of those awesome France TV moments today where they cut to Pino and suddenly Geshka was off the back of a bunch and Quinn Simmons was drilling it. I don't understand what was going on there. Is Trek trying to get the KOM jersey now. Like I'm not really following that part of the race super so closely. So appeared to have it like tightened up. I thought he had or buttoned up. I thought he had it. I don't know what happened there. He seemed seemed to come out of the pedals. Did you see that? He like wasn't in his pedals. A spectator had to help him, but by then it was too late. He couldn't sprint for it. Quinn Simmons has been sprinting for these KOM points for reasons unknown to anyone. I mean, he's really really far down in the classification. His teammate, Giulio Ciccone, is fourth, so maybe he's trying to lead him out but doesn't okay. know where the summit is and is accidentally taking them. Uh, but the big thing that happened in the KOM today is, did, I don't know if you noticed this, Pogacar attacked at the top of one of the climbs, and you know it was a yeah. weird place to attack because he, well, he just dropped McNulty, and it was really easy to, for Vinegar to respond because it was like 100 meters from the top. And at first I was like, wow, that was a really strange attack. And then I thought, is, is he sprinting for KOM points? And now I look at it, he's third in the KOM jersey. Jonas is second. So poor, poor Simone, I think, is going to get overtaken by Jonas and Pogacar because I bet tomorrow is a similar stage where there's no breakaway to soak up those points. Geshka's not going to be able to get up the road. I, I think we're seeing like a Pogacar is saying, well, I I don't think I can win yellow or yellow. I might not win yellow. I'm just going to win the KOM jersey. So it's kind of an interesting subplot there that I'm curious to see how it turns out. It's I think the same thing happened last year. I can't remember who it was. Someone appeared to have this like uh, one and had been fighting for three weeks for it. And then Pogacar won it accidentally um, without trying like in the last three stages by just winning on the summit finishes. Yeah, so it goes. I didn't understand all of this. So I'm really thankful that you just explained it, Spencer. And I'm kind of having this moment, like when you're watching the usual suspects at the end, when you realize that Verbal Kent is actually Kaiser Sose. If if what Pagachar is going for here is actually taking the polka dot jersey, that'd be really I have wild. to. I mean, that's really the only thing that makes that attack didn't really make sense otherwise, because it just isolated him with Jonas. And he didn't even keep pushing over the top. I, I, I'm curious to see what happens tomorrow if we see them sprinting for KOM points at the top of these climbs, which is bananas to think about because then they're gonna also going to be sprinting for the win up Otacom. And what's crazy is tomorrow's stage is even harder than this stage. Um, I think it's two or category climbs finishing on Otacom, which is a really, really, really hard climb. So as Andrew said at the beginning, this might just be the start of a Pogacar comeback. Oh, and I want to ask you a question. You said you had a theory about, so Mark Soler yesterday, uh, part of yeah, UAE's talk about it. meltdown where they, they lost Micah. They also lost Soler because he was like vomiting on the side of the road. And then for reasons unknown, the team made him finish the race. And he finished like a long, he finished 30 minutes behind Caleb Ewan, who was the last finisher and like 30 minutes outside of the time bonus or the, the time limit and also just a quick thing i think fabio jacobson made it inside the time limit by 10 seconds today which led absolute legend can't believe that happened but what was your theory about why did they have solar keep riding i actually had a hard time understanding that yeah so i reached out to you spencer and i asked what the status of his contract was because you were an encyclopedia of professional cycling business knowledge you t- uh, is it correct that his contract is up in 2023 or is he with the team through 2024? I'm pretty sure he's, it's up like he's employed through next year and then does not have a contract after that. Okay, through next year. 
Okay. What I wondered when this was going on, there seemed to be a lot of tension between the team and the writer. Again, Twitter's just going crazy with oh, what, what's happening here. And then when he didn't make the time cut, yeah, it didn't seem to make a lot of sense. What I was wondering was, was this some kind of statement that he was trying to make to other teams from a labor market point of view to let them know, hey, like I'm a very mentally tough person. I'm I'm going to keep going. I'm not somebody who's going to drop out of the race, even if I'm puking on myself repeatedly. Uh, when he didn't make the time cut, I, I just thought it might be him making a personal statement about his fortitude and mental toughness as a writer to enhance his position on the labor market, knowing that he probably wasn't going to come back from this and that this was his last chance to make a statement to other people who might employ him in the future. Because, I mean, I mean teams do care about this, right? They want to know that you're going to stay in the race and, and ride or die for your teammates. And then Twitter has other thoughts about this. But that was my take. It's what did you possible. see happening? I mean, because he does have a reputation as someone. I mean, look, I think he dropped out of a, the vault to last year, maybe. He has a reputation. Yeah, because he, he came from he came from Movistar. That's where he was from 2015 to 2021. And Spencer, you would know better than I their status within the Peloton and, and what other teams might think about the relative mental toughness of the riders there. I mean, they're, it's a, they're a very interestingly run team. We saw them with a rare team attack yesterday on a climb where a team was setting a very hard pace. <laughs> And just simple math would tell you we probably cannot, as a team, ride faster up a climb than a very fast rider setting pace behind us. And then they took over pacemaking for Yumbo. And I mean, pretty all the answers you need can be found in the Netflix Movistar documentary, which is a fantastic window into how poorly run that team is. Um, but Solaire, yeah, so he dropped out of the Giro after stage 12 la- or after stage 11 last year. I don't think the team was very happy with that. He was going to UAE. He was He's kind of known as like Im- impetulant. Maybe that's the right word. Maybe that's a word. I'm not quite sure. But he, like we saw him at, on the men's stage this year, gets into the break and tries to win the stage. It's like, but I don't know if that was sanctioned by the team because that didn't really fit into what they're trying to do with Pogacar. He's just kind of wasting energy up the road. He had the famous meltdown in the 2020 Volta where he was going to win the stage and he got called back to help Valverde and he threw a fit on the road. I don't think he's known as like the toughest guy, the most team player. So you could have you could have a point there where he's trying to telegraph to potential suitors that he's a team player. The weird thing about that is you'd think he's now like on the retirement team. Like, isn't UAE the place where you want to kind of settle down and make a bunch of money? And he could probably lead the team at the Volta or the Giro if he wanted. So it's it would be a little weird if he's already trying to get off the team. Um it it happens though especially in like a like the nba you see weirder things than that so you could have a point it almost felt like the absolute opposite end of the continuum from what we saw from miguel and hill lopez last year (laughs) oh man yes yeah it was the opposite end of of like i'm not injured i'm just kind of upset and sad i'm leaving where it's like solaire's so visibly injured I'm concerned about, I was concerned about his health during the stage. And then, I mean, you might, I, I read that as the team making him finish because if you're running a team, it's just like, well, you just got to like, we got to keep guys in this race. So we can't have three support riders plus Pogacar. That's not enough. Just try to make it to the finish. Try to make it to the finish. Maybe they'll take pity on us and let you start tomorrow. Um, and the team pushing them. But, you know, and the more I think about it, that, that does seem hard to believe that someone would be vomiting I heard he was vomiting every kilometer and the team makes him stay in the race. That that does actually seem irresponsible and that you might be, you could even be responsible for someone dying. I mean, you'd have to be really sick to be throwing up that much, but maybe it was his initiative to stay in the race. And for people who aren't familiar with what we're talking about with Miguel Angel Lopez, which I, I think it's important to talk about this, but during the Vuelta, he during a stage near the end of the race, his podium spot slipped out of grass because potentially because some decisions within the team about another rider on his team pulling in a break. He thought his team was riding against his personal interests while they were riding in the interests of the team. And he just pulled over to the side of the road, 
took his toys on and stage went 20, home, which on is stage a, 20. So yes. one stage to go and he would have finished yeah. top 10. It was bizarre. It was, it was a very peculiar move, unprecedented in the history of pro cycling, at least as long as I've been following it. And yeah, he was on Movistar at the time. And then he went back to, uh, yeah, Astana, Astana which super interesting little story there. Uh, he was on Astana. These Canadians come in the premier tech Canadians and they want to like actually run it like a real team. Uh, just <laughs> let's look at good riders and get them. Let's not sign bad riders to big contracts. Alexander Vinokurov took issue with this. He loves Lopez, even though Lopez, I think, has not finished on a Grand Tour podium in, I want to say, four or five years. I think maybe 2018 was the last time he finished on a Grand Tour podium, but he just loves Lopez, thinks this guy needs millions of dollars a year to be our leader. Um, the Canadians say, no, we're not interested. Like, let's not re-sign him. They let him go to Movistar. In the interim, Vinokurov gets his political muscle in back in Kazakhstan to kick the Canadians out. They leave the team. I'm not exactly sure what happened there. Um, Vinokurov comes back into power just as Lopez is falling out of favor with his new Movistar teammates or his new Movistar team management, and then they re-sign him back the next year. So it's like the rare breakup, divorce, new relationship breakup, get remarried to the person you divorced 12 months after divorcing them. Yeah, I think Roseanne Barron Tom Arnold maybe did this. Something just popped into my head. Spencer, going back to our conversation about TT bikes, because when I was thinking about the Vuelta, that Vuelta, I started to think about Egon Bernal. Egon Bernal's wreck while on a TT bike, riding into the back of a bus. Froome's wreck on a TT bike. These bikes just aren't really safe for the general population to be riding out on normal training routes and traffic. And I think that's another strike against them. And also, if you just take a look at a triathlon and the way the bikes have evolved today, uh, they're incredibly fast, but I don't think that they're relatable for the average person. So I just wanted to get that out there on the record. They are really, really unsafe because the new positions incentivize you to stare at your wheel, not at the road in front of you, which on a closed course can be okay. I, st I actually know someone whose brother died on a closed course because like a car had stopped you know because stuff happens like cars stop if someone has a flat in front of you and they hit the car in front of them um, because you're just incentivized to look straight down on these tt bikes or i in that case i think it was a triathlon bike yeah they're not they're in no way safe and bernal's crash is a great example of that just out on the open road on a tt bike is not a good place to be um part of me is like well the sport shouldn't you know, some of that, I guess, is personal responsibility. Like, you should probably just be able to decide if you think it's safe or not. Like, the sport shouldn't be policing riders' personal lives about what's safe and what isn't. But in that case, it does seem, it does seem a little weird that you have all these riders just not looking at the road in front of them, going really fast. They're going really fast in these time trial bikes, probably almost 40 miles an hour. Yeah, I don't think that you should incentivize riders doing things that are directly opposed to their safety, like a known lack of safety, which I think is what's happening with the time trial positions. And you could, again, you could say that about the Tour de France generally, like we've talked about, this is not a healthy thing to do. Riding down a Perennian Pass the way these guys do, probably not something that uh, is great from a safety point of view, but that's different from hey, you have to stare at your front wheel and you can't look up and see where you're going while you ride a bike, which we all know is a pretty fundamental aspect of not riding into things. Yeah, it's key. It's key when it comes to not running into things, just being able to see in front of you. I hear that looking at the road and seeing where you can go while you're operating any type of vehicle, including a hoverboard, is important. Yeah, there's like some studies coming out that say that does reduce the risk of a crash if you're looking where you're going, where you're operating the vehicle. Well, I've got to take off and pick my car up before they just toss it out onto the street at the dealership. But I, I'm curious to see how UAE handles this. They, I cannot believe they're in a position where they have three support riders plus Pogacar and did not seem to really adversely affect them today. I'm curious to see how they do tomorrow on what is it, an even harder stage. 
and Yumbo, who got a little worked over today. Uh, I'm curious to see how they come back from that as well. Yeah, and I think when we speak next, I want to take a look back on... We've been talking a lot about the energy that Pagachar expended in the first 10 days. Next time we talk, I think it's going to be revealing to take a look at the energy that Wout expended early on and whether or not that costs Yumbo. It might, it might not. Let's the only thing out. about it was a funny thing about Pagachar is he expended a lot of energy in the first 10 days. Kind of seem looking back, it seems like now his only mistake really was just not. If you if you go back and watch stage eleven, he I don't see him feed or drink at any point throughout that stage. That might just be the only mistake he made. If he if he feeds and doesn't pace in the Glavier, he probably wins this tour. Still unknown though. Maybe we'll find out after the tour if he just had bad sensations <laughs> that day because he hasn't. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there was another Twitter thread kicking today where people were talking about the fact that Vinyagard and Pagachar, neither of them seemed to be eating or drinking much in the last 50 kilometers of the race. And in fact, Pagachar chucked his gel when he got his bottle and gel hand up. Of course, he could be running 120 grams of carbs and ketones in that bottle. So that might have been all that he needed. We'll, ne we'll never know slash we might know at the end of this. So Spencer, I know you've got to bounce. I've got the PJ is warming up out on the runway. For, uh, we're about to do an uphill and downhill takeoff and landing. And if anybody wants to reach out to us, if you've got the inside information about what's going on with those feeding or drinking strategies, if you know why Quinn Simmons is charging so hard for these KOM points, we want to know. Hit us up on Twitter. Spencer is at BTP Cycling. I'm at Vance or at Hardway Pod. Really enjoyed your questions and getting to have a dialogue with all the listeners out there. So thanks and for being in touch. And if you have experience at this runway, I want to know which way do you take off, take off, which way do you land? Um, I need to know more about it. CC Jonathan Vodders. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks, Andrew. And we'll talk to everyone after the stage on Friday, which I think might be a sprint stage. But we'll have a time trial the following day to discuss. All right. Well, thank you. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye.